Some of you uh, probably know this song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, uh, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Well, this is the gal that wrote it, Anna Bartlett Warner. She wrote this song, and, and it was in a book, because it wasn't a song, it was just a poem. And the book's title is Say and Seal. It's a novel. Her sister wrote the novel. She wrote the poem. But her sister is writing a novel about a child that is dying. And this poem is what was read to the child that was dying to comfort the child. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me, loves me still though I'm very weak and ill. From his shining throne on high comes to watch me where I lie. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. Then his little child will take up to heaven for his dear sake. That was a poem. We know a little different lyrics that came along later. But the Bible tells us that the Lord loves us. Jesus loves me, and I want to just describe some of the ways in which he loves me. He loves me, first of all, with an inseparable love. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The verses before this says that God who did not spare his own son, God didn't spare his own son. He went to the extreme measure of having Jesus die in our place as our substitute because he loved us. He says, if he went to that extreme, reckless love, then how in the world could anything separate us from the love of Christ? He said, come on, trouble. Anybody here ever have trouble? I've had trouble. I don't know if I've ever told you a story about driving down the road and all of a sudden my hood of my car flashed up. I'm going 55 miles an hour. You know what that is? That's like a really scary experience. Your heart kind of stops for a moment. I slam on my brake, pull over to the side of the road, get out, trying to push the lid back on my car. This is trouble. It won't latch. So here's the preacher. Car's going by. Church is just down the street. People in the community know who I am. I'm out on the hood of my car, jumping up and down <laughs> to get it to latch. You know, you got problems. So I get to the church, and I notice also that I was running a little hot, so I'm going to open it, put some water in it. Now I can't get the hood to open. You ever had troubles like that? So I decide I'll go back home and I'll get some tools. We're going to get this thing open. So I'm driving back home, and sure enough, same place where it opened before, boom, it decides to open up again. I slam on my brakes. i got to go through this all over again. You ever had troubles? I'm out there jumping up and down on the hood of my car. Finally, I get it home. I walk into the house, and I tell my wife, if I owned a gun, I'd go out there and shoot that car. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we have troubles. Trouble does not separate us from the love of Christ. Come on, we've all had bad days. Hardships, difficulties. Maybe you've got a difficult boss or a difficult neighbor. You've got difficulties in your life. Hardship does not separate us from the love of Christ. Or persecution. I don't know if you've ever been persecuted. Maybe not. Persecution may be coming. There is a counter-cultural, cancel culture mentality going on. Christianity is intertwined with our American culture, so sooner or later they may be coming for us because we believe what the Bible says, and the Bible says some things that the new culture thinks is hate speech, and so they may be coming after us. Real persecution may be coming, but most of the time persecution comes in the form that somebody does not like you. And you just work around that. Can persecution separate us from the love of, of, of Christ? And the answer to that is no. He says famine, going without food, nakedness, having no clothes, danger, sword, somebody threatening your life. He says inseparable. You see, the answer to all those, the expected answer is none of those things can separate us. There is no chasm between me and Christ. When Jesus saved me and made me an object of his love, he never took that love back. 
It goes on and says, As it is written, for your sake we face death all the day long. He said, listen, every day we face death. That does not remove the love of Christ. Just because my life is, I'm in bad times, he still loves me. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He always loves me. It is inseparable. He, he does not take it away. The Calvinists are accused of um, believing in eternal security. And they have a flower that's called the tulip. And it stands for different doctrines. Total depravity, unconditional election, uh, election a limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And the perseverance of the saints is called eternal security. Now, those that oppose the Calvinists, they are the Arminians, and the Arminians have their flower. It's called the daisy, because it goes, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. There is no daisy here. Nothing can separate us. It is inseparable. We cannot be separated from the love of God. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We win. Anybody here ever read the last couple chapters of the book of Revelation? <laughs> Beginning of chapter 19 on, we win. I don't care what happens through this whole life. In the end, I'm going to be as the bride of Christ. Yeah, me, a bride. I'm going to be as the bride of Christ, loved by Christ, forever and ever and ever and ever I win. I win, I win. Because nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Listen, this passage ties right back into where we were last week. The love of God. We have the love of Christ. We have the love of God. Watch what it says. To separate, there's nothing that can separate. He says, nor anything else can separate us from the love of God. Remember what we said last time? It is inseparable. There's no chasm that separates us. In fact, he says, neither death nor life. I'm just going to read these. We did these last week. Neither angels nor demons, neither what is present today, February 14, 2021, or the future, come to the end of the year. Nothing can separate us. Time cannot separate us from the love of God. Listen, neither power, and I don't know of anything more powerful than that, neither height nor depth nor any other thing in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to say, Jesus loves me. Come on, say it. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Yeah. There will be times when you feel like nobody loves you. You will feel alone. You will feel abandoned. You'll, you, you'll, and you're going to say, why even try? That's when you need this little, little song, Jesus Loves Me, that I know. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Now, the second place that this expression occurs, the love of Christ, and there's three of them that we're looking at. It's the inseparable love of Christ, and it is the compelling love of Christ. In the King James Version, it says, for the, the love of Christ constrains me. The New International Version has. For the love of Christ, they don't want you to mix, mix this up, that it's your love for him that is constrained. No, no, no. It's Christ's love for you. So they don't say the, the love of Christ. They, they want you to be clear on this. It's Christ's love that compels us. And here's the idea of compelling. It's like a magnet. It just draws you in. When you know Jesus, that love, I mean, when you contemplate what Jesus has done for you, that love just pulls you right in. The more you meditate on the love of Jesus Christ for you, the more you are compelled and constrained to love him back. It's true. He says the love of Christ compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. And if he died for all, he died for me. And I get very personal with that. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He's the one who saved me. He died for all. He says, therefore, all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them. I was eight years old. 
when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was at camp. The next day, I hadn't forgotten what he did. I went to the camp bookstore, and I bought a Bible, and I bought a postcard, and you know I've told you my story. I wrote home, told my mom I got staved. <laughs> I didn't even know how to spell it. I got staved. Something happened in my life. He gave me life. He infused it. And at eight years old, I knew I wanted to live for Jesus. By the time I was 12, I wanted to live for Jesus. At the same camp, I made a commitment that when I got home, I was going to tell the pastor I wanted to be baptized because they talked about it at camp. I said, I need to do that. I love Jesus. Of course, I wandered away as a teenager. But because I'm a child of God, he brought me back. He loved me so much. He was not going to let me wander away. He brought me back. Now, it was painful. It was hurtful. Two of my friends died. I was hospitalized because of my rebellion and my sin in my life. But I knew immediately that I needed to reconnect with him and made a covenant commitment, Lord, I will serve you all the days of my life. You love me so much. You saved me. You spared my life. I want to live for you. You see, it's this love of Christ that compels us that we should live for him. It's amazing that from time to time I find people who claim to be Christians, but they don't go to church. They don't read their Bibles. They don't pray. And I'm wondering, where is the compelling love of Christ in their life? Have they missed heaven, like we talked about last week, between their head and their heart? They know it in their head that they prayed a prayer years ago, but it never migrated to their heart where they just have a desire and a thirst for God and righteousness just to say, Lord, I love you back. How many want to be in a love relationship with someone here on earth where you love them and they always treat you like dirt? Nobody wants that. I ask that question sometimes when I was dealing with singles and a guy will raise his hand and say, I'll take anything I can get. <laughs> and sometimes that's the, that's the case. People are so hurting for real love. They'll take anything they can get. Anything. They'll join a gang because the gang members are like family. At least they love me. You see what I'm saying? No, you, you want to be loved and, and God loved you so much and he wants you to love him back. He said, I'm so compelled when I think about the love of Christ that I should no longer live for myself, but I'm living for him who died for me. And he rose again and I have a relationship with him. The next occurrence of this uh, expression, the love of Christ, is found in Ephesians 3, 19. It says, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So I got this. Here, here's the love that goes beyond all loves. Here's a love that goes beyond anyone on earth loving you. This, this is God's love. He loves you. In the text it says, and I pray for you, being rooted and established in love, that, that this love has taken deep roots. You know, we use the word love so frivolously in, 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 in English. I'll say I love football. I, I love ice cream. And then I'll say to my kids, I love you. I'll say to my spouse, you want to make love. And it all has different meanings, all those meanings. Not intimate at all, fully intimate. Not intimate at all is no roots. No roots. The one that's very intimate, the Valentine's Day love that we talk about, is the kind that you want to have deep roots, deep relationship. He says, I'm praying that you would be rooted so that when the wind comes, your tree doesn't get knocked over. Your marriage doesn't get knocked over. Your relationship doesn't get knocked over because you've got deep roots, deep roots, and your relationship is strong and it stands. He's praying that you will have that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ, deeply rooted. And a powerful relationship at that. 
that being rooted in Christ, that you will have the power of the gospel in your life. For it is the power of God unto salvation that you will really know him and know the power of his resurrection in your life that it will actually change the way you live. It has the power to change you from the inside out. He says, together with all the saints, he wants us to grasp this surpassing deep love of Christ. He wants you to grasp how wide, how high, how long, how deep, all four dimensions. Somebody has said that describes John 3.16. For God, that's how high. So loved, that's the world, that's how deep. That he gave his only begotten son. That's, it just goes on. That, that whosoever, that's, that's as wide as you can get it. Anybody who will. And they, they said, this, this is the love of God found in Jesus Christ. That's surpassing love. You probably don't recognize this guy. His name is D.L. Moody. Ever heard the name? Yeah, D.L. Moody. He was a great evangelist. And he started Moody Bible Institute. He pastored the Moody Church. But he was a great evangelist uh, in the, the 19th century. Uh, he traveled across the states to England, Europe, and, and he preached the gospel. And, and he was just a great evangelist. While he was in England, D.L. Moody ran into a young man by the name of Mary, uh, Harry Morehouse. And Harry Morehouse was a young upstart brethren preacher that went up to Moody and said, when I come to America, I'll preach in your church. Whoa, that was a pretty bold statement, this young guy. And uh, so he says, well, when you come to America, you let me know, and I'll let you preach in my church, thinking he's never coming to America. Well, not too long later, he does arrive in America, and he sends a telegram from New York to Chicago. I'll be there on Thursday. He said, I'm ready to preach in your church. And Moody just so happened that he was going to be out of town Thursday night. We'll just have a special meeting, let this young, young upstart come in and preach. And so um, he told the, you know, the, the elders of the church, he said, uh, you know, keep an eye on him. Let's see what he does. And so they called a, a Thursday night meeting. He came in. He opened up his Bible to John 3.16. He preached for whatever it was, an hour or so, closed his Bible, Scores of people responded, accepted Jesus, and became, became Christians. The elders were so impressed that can you come back again tomorrow night? So Friday night, <laughs> Harry Morehouse went up to the pulpit, opened up his Bible to John 3.16. He preached John 3.16 again. And uh, that night, scores of people responded to it at Moody's church. Now, he's an evangelist, Okay. Scores of people responded. Well, on Saturday, they'd schedule him to preach again. Saturday morning, Moody comes back home from his, his trip that he was on. And he said to his wife, anxious to hear, how did he do? And she says, oh, it was marvelous. You have to come so you can get converted too. <laughs> now, that wasn't the thing you'd want to say on Valentine's Day, you know, because that kind of ruffled his feathers. So he went that night to see what this young upstart was doing. He went to the pulpit. He said, you know, I look for something to preach for you, you tonight. And he said, I couldn't find anything better than John 3.16. He got up and he preached the love of Christ from John 3.16 again. And scores of people responded. And Moody later wrote that was a changing point in his life and ministry too. He had been preaching hellfire and damnation, that you're going to hell, and the only way to avoid that was accept Christ, because he was like your insurance policy. The first time he saw that, it's the, the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And Moody began preaching, began preaching a different way, and his, and his ministry exploded. Listen, folks. The people that get right in your face, they turn you off. But if you show the love of Christ, because you know the love of Christ, it will turn them on. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody. You're no exception. I know you want it. I want it. We all want it. 
And he kept pointing them to the love of Christ. Listen, Morehouse knew it, it says here, and to know the, this love that surpasses knowledge. He didn't know just about the love. He knew the love. He experienced the love. He had a love relationship with Jesus Christ. He met with him in the scriptures, and Jesus spoke to him. And then he, he met with him in prayer, and he spoke, spoke to Jesus. He shared that love. When you love someone, you share that person with other people. You can't help it. You are compelled. I rarely call my wife Diane Diane. I always call her my wife. In fact, I have my own little pet names that I don't share, but they're, my, they're dear. But when, 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 when I'm introducing her, she's with me, and there's somebody there. Say, oh, this is my wife. I have this relationship, husband, wife, with her. The, 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 when we know Jesus Christ and we're in love with him because he loved me, I have to share that I am a Christian. Jesus loves me, this I know. Hey, Jesus will love you too. You just have to make him your Lord and Savior too. You, you can't contain it. That surpassing love that is compelling you to share it because he'll never let go of you. Moody learned it, which means that I can learn it too. I can learn to have this relationship so that it overflows and spills out of me. Truth is, I want to learn it. I want to learn it. I want to have that, that kind of relationship. The text goes on and it says it's the surpassing fullness of God that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wouldn't you love to have all the fullness of God's love manifest in your life? He wants that relationship with you. He wants it with me. All that fullness. Anna Warner was full of this kind of love. That's why she wrote this poem, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. So it was just a couple years later, two years later, that the tune was added from the poem out of the book Lyrics changed just a little bit, and a refrain added by William Bradbury. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his child, little child come in. The refrain, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago, taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. That's the original version. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Christ, the love of Christ, is God's valentine to you, the love of Christ. Today, it's God's valentine to you. He loved you so much, he sent his love, his son for you. And you can love him back by giving your heart back to him. And that's what we want to do today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to experience in our lives the full power of this inseparable, compelling love of Christ that surpasses every other love. Lord, we want to experience that. Help us to build the relationship with you so that it spills out of us to others. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.